Good evening, everyone. My name is John Donnelly, and I am the chairman of the National Press Club's Press Freedom Committee. And by day, I'm a reporter for CQ Roll Call. I want to welcome you to tonight's event, which is entitled Double Exposure. And we're going to tell the story of how the Memphis Commercial Appeal newspaper unearthed the extraordinary tale of Ernest Withers, who was a famous photographer of the civil rights movement and at the same time an informant for the FBI. Tonight's event is brought to you by the Press Club's Press Freedom Committee and also by our Young Members Committee. The Press Freedom Committee, if I may just tell you for a moment, spearheads the Press Club's efforts to fight back against repression of the press both here at home and abroad. And we also push hard to make sure that governments everywhere are as open to the public as possible. And if you're interested in joining the club or just learning more about us, the website is press.org. Now tonight's event is especially timely because of what it says about how newspapers, even as their business models feel intense pressure, can still do public interest journalism that takes a long time and costs a bit of money. It's also timely because of what it says about the importance of freedom of information laws in that pursuit, and not least because it touches on government surveillance of citizens in a democracy, which is also a very timely subject. And we could not have a more perfect moderator for tonight's panel than Chuck Tobin, who is the gentleman sitting in the middle here. I'm going to introduce Chuck to you and get out of the way. Chuck's a former journalist who now chairs a nationwide team of media lawyers at the firm of Holland and Knight, and he's based here in Washington, D.C. Chuck's a member of the club's Press Freedom Committee. He's a former chair of the American Bar Associations and the D.C. Bar Associations Media Law Committees. He was also lead counsel for the Memphis Commercial Appeal in the litigation against the FBI over the Ernest Withers files. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> so let me just be a smart guy and turn it over to the panel. John, Chuck? Thank you, John. Uh, it's a, an honor and a privilege to be here, and we all give our thanks uh, to the National Press Club's Freedom of the Press Committee and the Young Members Committee uh, for hosting this panel. You see on the screens a picture of uh, Ernest Withers. Ernest Withers, as John uh, told you, and as everybody who came here uh, knows, Ernest Withers was a noted photographer in Memphis uh, and at the same time, thanks to the intrepid work of uh, our panel uh, member next to me, uh, we also now know at the same time that he was given uh, access and the trust of the leadership of the civil rights movement, he was also informing on the movement to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And there are, that is the what, and there are a lot of questions about the why, questions you have, questions we have, questions that we, we want to find the answers to. And part of the panel t discussion tonight is to focus on the story of who Ernest Withers was and why he became involved in the story in this particular way. But as my friends in print journalism would say, that's really just the main bar of this uh, whole story. There are lots of sidebars. And tonight we're going to discuss some of those sidebars as well. There is the story of the Freedom of Information Act litigation uh, that Mark and uh, the Memphis Commercial Appeal brought and how the FOIA process really worked to our advantage to help tell this story. There's the story of the uh, Scripps Company, the E.W. Scripps Company, which owns the commercial appeal. And as John noted in introducing me, in this day and age, it's highly unusual and indeed courageous for newspaper companies to be spending precious resources on investigations and litigation like this. And then finally, in any big story, there's a, a why do we care? There's a social and historical context. And we're going to delve into that context today and try and put Ernest Withers into part of the historical mosaic of what was going on in the FBI and in the civil rights movement during the 1960s and early 1970s. So to tell this story and to tell these sidebars, we've assembled uh, a panel of direct players and other interested people. Uh, the most important player uh, on the main bar of this story is Mark Perisquia with the Commercial Appeal newspaper. 
Mark's superb work is what told us all uh, about Ernest Withers, and he's actually been pursuing this story, as he'll tell you, since 1997, which is a colossally long time for such a young journalist as Mark to have been uh, pursuing this story, and he's done a very good job at that. Mark has been with the Commercial Appeal for 24 years. Prior to that, he did tours of duty in the newsrooms at the Duluth News Tribune in Minnesota and the Bradenton Herald in Florida, and he's a proud graduate of the University of Minnesota. Uh, to my right um, is David Giles. Dave Giles is Vice President and Deputy General Counsel and Chief Ethics Officer at the E.W. Scripps Company. Dave is uh, the secret weapon and best friend to all of Scripps newsrooms across its uh, platform of 13 newspaper and 19 broadcast and the internet platform markets. He is the first call when journalists have a legal problem and a legal issue and he counsels and helps them work through problems and where appropriate brings in outside counsel uh, to help them get the news out. Dave is perfectly suited for that work because before he joined Scripps, in fact before he became a lawyer, he was a reporter for the Philadelphia Inquirer and USA Today, and so he, he feels their pain. Uh, he, knows, he knows what they go through. And between his newsroom work and joining Scripps, he also was a very prominent litigation attorney here in the Washington, D.C. market. Uh, also joining us today uh, on my far left is historian David Garrow. David Garrow uh, is both a historian and a Pulitzer Prize winning author of the book Bearing the Cross, Martin Luther King Jr. and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, among other important works of history that he's written. He frequently writes on the civil rights movement for the New York Times, The Nation, The Financial Times, and The New Republic. Uh, and in addition to that print work, he was senior advisor to PBS for the award-winning series Eyes on the Prize, which documented a series of milestone events in the civil rights movement. He currently serves on the faculty of University of Pittsburgh, holding dual appointments in both law and the Department of History, and he's previously taught at a number of other esteemed institutions, including American University here in the Washington, D.C. area. And then finally, helping us round out the discussion, uh, on my far right is Mizell Stewart, Vice President for Content with the newspaper group at E.W. Scripps. E.W. Scripps is based in Cincinnati. In that job, Mizell oversees the editors in Scripps' 13 newspaper platforms, helping them develop content strategy, news and information production across both their print and their print and digital platforms. He came to that job at Scripps uh, through Scripps' Evansville Courier and Press newspaper, where he was the editor for five years. Previous to that, he served editorial positions in the newsrooms at the Akron Beacon Journal and the Biloxi Sun Herald. And Mizell also um, led the team at the Tallahassee Democrat but way back in the year 2000 over their uh, award-winning coverage of the election recount in Florida, which is actually where I had the privilege of meeting and working with Mizell. And so we have uh, with us um, a full panel of people ready to delve into all of the different stories and main bars and side bars. And to start it all off, I thought maybe we would dress the table with the historical setting. And so let me ask um, David Garrow, we're here to talk about Ernest Withers and the FBI. Let's talk about the FBI first. What were they doing domestically in the 1960s? I think the first thing to emphasize about the FBI's domestic security efforts in the 50s and 60s is that human informants were far and away the major building block. Back in those decades, electronic surveillance, either wiretaps or microphones, uh, were exceptionally time consuming and relatively expensive to operate. So it's only in relatively unusual cases with Dr. King, some of Dr. King's advisors, um, Elijah Muhammad, head of the Nation of Islam. Only in very unusual cases did the FBI go to the effort and the cost of mounting widespread electronic surveillance. So human informants were the bread and butter of the FBI's domestic security coverage, whether it's the American Communist Party, the Socialist Workers Party, the Nation of Islam, the Civil Rights Movement. 
and agents in every office were tasked with recruiting human informants. And that tasking had a, a statistical, uh, you know, measure up element to it. Um, now, it bears emphasis without, without treading on what Mark's going to talk about, that the vast majority of these human informants uh, whom the FBI recruited were not paid. And certainly in a good number of civil rights movement instances, these individuals didn't realize that the Bureau viewed them and coded them in the FBI's numeric filing system as informants. Um, and in multiple instances that, that I've encountered in years past, um, you know, someone who was a minister in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, you know, would recall, oh yes, the FBI agents would come and talk to me every month or so about what was going on. And certainly in, say, the mid or late 1950s in the Deep South, uh, a lot of people in the movement thought of the FBI as, as potentially uh, helpful and, and supportive of the movement. They, they weren't at that time viewing the Bureau um, as this hostile force. Well, indeed, we've all seen the, the, the film of federal agents helping to integrate the schools in the South uh, against the resistance that was there. Where did this notion that the civil rights movement in the mind of the FBI posed some kind of a threat that needed surveillance. Where did that come from? J. Edgar Hoover's FBI had had a fixation on communism and the American Communist Party uh, going back to the 1930s and 1940s. By the late 40s, early 50s, uh, the Bureau is uh, extremely focused on the supposed danger of is, is the Communist Party infiltrating black America, you know, the Negro movement. Um, and across the, the course of the 1950s, uh, the FBI has a, a quite friendly relationship, for example, with the NAACP, major, you know, civil rights organization uh, of that time. Um, and so right up into the early 60s, um, it's, 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 you know, only in the early 60s uh, does it really uh, come to be seen in black America uh, that the FBI's interest is, is problematic and potentially dangerous uh, rather than helpful. Um, but the Bureau's, the Bureau's fear that the African American freedom struggle uh, was vulnerable to manipulation by uh, Soviet agents, Soviet agents of influence. Uh, that's a un, uh, hugely exaggerated but very constant theme uh, coming right up uh, across the whole decade of the 1960s. So organizationally, was there a, um, a program of racial informants? Did it become a focus? Initially, the Bureau has both security informants and criminal informants. Uh, racial informants are then added, uh, sort of broken off and expanded as a category. Um, those of us, myself and Mark, who've done a lot of work in FBI files, um, you know, there, there are numerical designations. Um, 170 becomes the FBI file category uh, for racial informants. Previously, security informants were 134s. Um, but it's, it's the size of the program, just how many people were viewed as sources and informants by the FBI that needs to be stressed. Mark, take us to Memphis with that national perspective. What was going on in Memphis uh, within the FBI's racial informant program in the 60s? Well, starting out in the early 60s, it was a very sleepy environment for the on, on the civil rights trail. Um, you had uh, Memphis is a small field office. Um, they had two, basically two agents working domestic intelligence, William Lawrence, who 
who did it for decades there, and um, often younger agents who worked with him. In the early 60s, it was pretty much focused on communism. It was very much the Cold War. Um, they were trying to investigate communist infiltration in you know, the very small and struggling labor movement and also within the NAACP. And um, as Professor Garrow said, I mean, um, you know, th there was great cooperation among the leadership of the NAACP. Um, we have no evidence that any, any of these individuals were paid, but they did, um, they did uh, uh, meet regularly with the FBI. The FBI came and talked to them, and they cooperated. Um, kind of leaving the early 60s to the, to the, to the mid-60s, as the anti-war movement talk, took off, you had a very flourishing peace movement in Memphis. Um, not a whole lot's been written about that, but there were, there were big demonstrations. The FBI was very concerned about that. Anti-war? Anti-war, Vietnam yeah. War. Um, you would have, you'd have marches going, five-mile marches going through um, you know, parts of Memphis right through downtown. Um, Reverend James Lawson was very much involved in this. Um, and then kind of taking you into the end of the 60s um, as, as the elements of the civil rights movement became more radicalized. The focus kind of shifted then to militancy and uh, black nationalism, this fear that you know there were separatist groups that wanted to overthrow the government. That was kind of fueling a lot of what the FBI was doing. And as I mentioned, Agent William Lawrence, uh, he was a native of Ohio. He um, uh, served 27 years in the FBI, 25 of them in Memphis. He got there in 1945, just as World War II ended. He was very much a Cold Warrior. I, you know, I, I had spent a lot of time with his daughter. He's deceased now. Um, and uh, who was very helpful to me. Um, he uh, was very much the uh, domestic intelligence agent. He had a subscription to the, the, the uh, communist uh, newspaper, The Daily Worker, under a very, very thinly veiled alias, William Harvey. His name was William Harvey Lawrence. Wow. And, and so, um, and he had any a number of uh, informants who he had recruited uh, to help him in, in this endeavor. Um, he, his, his crowning achievement was in 1954. Um, there was a, a, an American Communist Party um, leader from North Carolina named Junius Scales who had been indicted under the Smith Act, um, which had made it a crime to try to overthrow the government and also simply to be a member of the Communist Party. And Junius Scales was in hiding throughout the South and through his network of informants, Lawrence determined that he was actually in Memphis and arrested him on a rainy night in Memphis in 1954. And, and uh, his daughter, Betty, you know, shared with me these documents, which are online on our website. He got a personal letter of commendation from J. Edgar Hoover. Wow. Um, yeah, uh, Scales was the only uh, American ever go to prison simply for being a member of a political party. Interesting. He was, a, he was a w wonderful, sweet man. I, <laughs> I knew him in, in North Carolina in the 1980s. And he's, he's still in, he, when he's in federal prison, he's quit the party by the time they send him to federal prison. Yeah, he's kind of had it. I think they'd outed Stal Stalin by then, and they realized all the crimes, and he was very disillusioned by that. All right, so we have um, uh, the FBI looking for communists under every bed. They decide that they need to pay attention to the growing civil rights movement um, and the black empowerment movement in the South. We have Agent Lawrence in Memphis um, starting to show interest in that area and arresting suspected communists. Where does Ernest Withers come in? Who was he? Let's talk about that, Mark. Before we knew that he was an FBI informant, what do we know about Ernest Withers? Well, Ernest was born in 1922 in Memphis. He, he grew up poor. His dad was a letter carrier, and his mom was a uh, cleaning lady. And his, um, his opportunities at that time seemed very limited. Um, he very much expected to follow his father in his footsteps and become a letter carrier himself. But early in life, he, he, um, he got interested in photography. His sister had given him a camera in high school, and he later um, uh, served in the Army in World War II and had the good fortune of being assigned to a photography unit um, and where he learned how to shoot in the field and, and mix lab chemicals and, and was on the side selling uh, photographs to servicemen who would, you know, for like a dollar or two and they would mail them back home and he found that he could make a living at this. And so when he gets back to Memphis, he, um, he, he gets a, um, a loan through the GI Bill and opens a photography studio and he, he eventually moves it to Beale Street, which if any of you know Memphis, I mean Beale Street, uh, uh, it's very well known. I mean, as a, as a blues scene back in the time, it was really the, the hub of the uh, uh, black life in Memphis. You know, the, the, it was the whole business street. 
and um, he uh, was a studio photographer. He took wedding pictures, baby pictures. He got to know everybody in town. Um, and on the side, he had a large family. He eventually had eight children. He, um, he uh, started freelancing for the local paper, the Tri-State Defender, which owned, owned by the Singstack family out of Chicago, who also ran the Chicago Defender. And so okay. this takes him to the arc of his life, gets to a point where um, he's a young man in his early 30s, uh, raising a family, and the civil rights movement starts to blossom. And he, um, he starts getting these assignments from the Tri-State Defender, the Chicago Defender, and his pictures ran all over the country and various black newspapers. Tell us about some of the pictures that we're going to uh, display. This first picture posters. that you see here is from 1966. This is, um, you know, this is well into the civil rights movement. Um, he, you know, he'd, he'd been working it for 10 years, starting with the, the murder of Emmett Till down in Memphis. He covered that trial down there. Um, this, this, Ernest is the man with the big camera around his, his neck. That's a a twins reflex camera. He had to actually look down through the top of it. I don't know if any of you ever did that. It's a clumsy, uh, he, he used one of those pretty much throughout his career until like, you know, later in life. But so Ernest is in the lead there. This really shows you the access that he had. He was very trusted. He knew all the, all the, the, the leaders of the movement, both in Memphis and nationally. Just identify some of the people. You can see Dr. King with the, the white short sleeves, uh, sle short sleeves behind. That's Reverend James Lawson. He was the father of the nonviolent movement and, and actually moved to Memphis in 1963. He's the man with the dark shades on. Stokely Carmichael is the man with the head bowed uh, kind of behind over Lawson's shoulder. And so Ernest is out shooting this picture. This was uh, 1966. James Meredith had just been shot on this march against fear going through Mississippi. And uh, he's in the hospital and Dr. King takes it over. And so they're marching down to Jackson uh, Mississippi and Ernest is there covering it but as you can see he kind of wears two hats he's very very familiar uh, familiar with everybody and they they like him they trust him and he's part of the group really this picture here is from 1956 and this was a year after the Emmett Till trial and this was the Montgomery bus boycott and the very young man you see looking out the window there with the with the belt hat on is Dr. King. I think he was 27 then. And of course, Ralph Abernathy, his close friend, right next to him, Ernest took this picture on, um, he went down, this was the day that the Supreme Court had ruled that uh, desegregation on the buses down there was illegal. And Ernest got up bright and early in the morning, I think at four in the morning, and actually joked that Dr. King wasn't the first man to ride at an uh, integrated bus. He was, Withers, because he'd been riding the bus all morning waiting for Dr. King to show up. And he took the, look at this pic, the composition of this picture is amazing. I mean, it's, you know, you see Dr. King and everything in the foreground here, and you see the, the white gentleman in the back, and actually in the back of the bus. And this kind of, it's, 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 it, this picture, when, when Ernest died in 2007, ran in the New York Times. I mean, this has been shown worldwide. So. It's kind of the paparazzi of the movement yeah, down yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, he was doing, that I think about it. yeah, he, he, was, he, was, he was a freelancer. He, he was never on staff, but I mean, a lot of these seminal photos, he's, he was there for the, you know, a lot of these seminal events, you know, like the Emmett Till trial, the Montgomery bus boycott, the integration of Ole Miss. I mean, he was he was covering it all. Let's take a I look at some of his other work. This is 1966 again. This is Dr. King at the Lorraine Motel. He was later shot and killed there two years later in 1968. Um, again, you see the access that that Ernest had. Ernest did not inform on Dr. King day to day because Dr. King was based in Atlanta and Ernest was based in Memphis. And so, but when Dr. King came to Memphis, he did inform on him and he, the FBI, he would tell the FBI where he's staying, you know, kind of what his movements were, who he was meeting with, that sort of thing. Um, How about this one? This photo here is the day before Dr. King's death, April 3rd, 1968. And if any of you have been to the Memphis airport, it kind of still looks the same. <laughs> it's like you get under the, 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 the portico there, and that's, uh, it's a little bigger now, but it looks basically the same. And, so this and is him arriving to participate. This is, all right, this, the setting of this is Dr. King had been in and out of Memphis for two weeks in, prior to this. He, he had been invited to help assist, to help rally the city's garbage workers, the sanitation workers. They were striking. They were very oppressed. They were downtrodden. They worked for you know very low wages under very oppressive conditions, and uh, Dr. King had a number of other things on his plate at the time. This is uh, April of '68. 
Um, he was organizing his Poor People's Campaign, the March on Washington, but took time to come here to, well, to Memphis and to support the Senate. And so he's, and a week before this photo was taken uh, was a very pivotal moment because Dr. King was leaving the march through Memphis down Beale Street and at the back of the march erupted in a riot. So one of the first time, I think, I think the first time that anything like that had happened and the you know, windows were broken, police responded with clubs and mace and um, a young man, a teenager actually died in, in the mm -hmm. melee. I mean, he was killed by, shot and killed by police and so, and, and Dr. King was just totally depressed over this thing. I mean, this was going to ruin his reputation. He was getting, he was getting, um, you know, criticized all across the, you know, the country. And he knew he had to come back to lead this peaceful march. And so, and Ernest is there, of course, you know, the, the, the newsman that he is to take the picture. This picture right here was taken the morning of that disastrous march. This is a very famous photo. A lot of people who, who study civil rights know this. It's the I am a man uh, uh, placards that the sanitation workers, the, they're dressed up in their Sunday best, ready to, de to, to, to march through downtown Memphis. And um, uh, Ernest actually helped design those uh, placards. Is it little, you know, he was, again, the dual roles that he served. He was a civil rights insider and a journalist who covered it. And, um, but he had helped, I, I think he actually, I, I believe the story is, is that the, the, the pine boards attached to them, he had helped saw those up and, and had some role in actually designing the, the placards. There's himself. actually some beautiful artwork and paintings that are based right. uh, on this photo. And for a while there was a mural up here in downtown Washington mm -hmm. on the side of a building with the I am a man poster. Yes, ma'am. Well, Glenn was on, but the, the artist uh, had the I am a man and it was in the trunk of the Metroplex bus. Now, the, the woman in the audience just um, let us know that the National Gallery of Art has um, uh, in its collection one of the, photo one of the um, paintings based on this photograph. Thank you for that. Um, let's take a look at um, one more. This is uh, late April 4th, 1968, or early in the mor next morning. This is uh, d outside Dr. King's room at uh, uh, 306 at the Lorraine, uh, the dark kind of silhouette that you see, that, that's actually Dr. King's blood. Ernest, again, he knew Dr. King and his staff. They let him into his room. He shot a lot of pictures that night of Dr. King's staff, kind of intimate photos, and was out on the, out on the balcony that night. This out Dr. King had been standing along the railing here on the second floor of the Lorraine Motel when a, a sniper shot him and killed him. And so, you know, there's no people in the picture, but yet it's a powerful picture, you know. Absolutely. All right, so Mark, this is, this is, is and will always remain a big part of Ernest Withers' legacy is that he was the leading documentary photographer of the civil rights movement, at least in Memphis and arguably uh, for much of the movement. Um, how did you come to learn and, and suspect that there was more to the story of Ernest Withers? Well, that takes us back to 1997, and it, I really haven't been working on the story that long, but it's <laughs> um, kind of like I can't really get the story. Huh? But uh, no, what, happened, what was going on in 1997 is um, James Earl Ray, the convicted assassin of Dr. King, was still alive, and he was dying of liver disease and was trying to get out of prison, and he was fl floating a number of uh, petitions in criminal court there. And his lawyer um, was 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 coming up with a number of conspiracy stories, really trying to take the focus away from James Earl Ray, and uh, came very very close to actually, uh, I think, uh, securing James Earl Ray's release. Um, at one point, uh, his attorney uh, got the King family to endorse his conspiracy stories, and. Dr. King's son, Dexter, actually went to prison. I don't know if some of you might remember this, where James Earl Ray was staying in Nashville, shook his hand and said, we believe you. And this picture went worldwide. I mean, it was just stunning. It was like, wow. Um, so it was in that context that I, um, I uh, contacted this old FBI agent who had, who, who had been involved in the security investigations of Dr. King and started talking with him and um, you know he was a real crotchety old guy and I mean he you know I was asking about the conspiracy stuff and he says that's all a bunch of bull you know that you know, it's like you, you can't believe that but really really you know and I had already surmised that but um, what I really was interested in was the surveillance what were they doing you know how were they monitoring Dr. King and then because you always heard these stories and Professor Garrow has written extensively about, you know, the electronic surveillance of Dr. King, but it always, you know, ended before Memphis. And so I was curious, you know, did, was there any electronic surveillance of Dr. King in Memphis? Sure. And he says, no, absolutely not. We didn't do any. 
And so I said, well, what about photographic surveillance? And this is where <laughs> he said, we didn't need photographic surveillance. He said, we had Ernest Weathers. And um, that's, when I, that's how I first found out about Weathers. And he actually went into some detail about, you know, the informant coverage that, you know, they had, they had I mean, and they did have Memphis covered with informants. I mean, on a whole ra a spectrum of, you know, um, from people who were just very low level, and most of these people weren't paid. There were only five, what they called racial informants in Memphis in 1968, who were actually paid, and Ernest was one of them. Um, but you know, he kind of primed the pump at that time and said, you know, that anybody who was anybody, he got pictures on, he got reports on, but he would never go on the record. He didn't want any of this tied to him in any way. This was, is the FBI agent. Yes, retired, and so th there was nothing that I could do with it. He, in fact, he told me at one point that he says if I ever wrote about this, he'd deny it. You know, okay. so so I was kind of stuck to a point where um, this whole James Earl Ray stuff just died down, and the story, you know, ended and. I took my notes and tucked them away in boxes and, you know, and really forgot about it until, you know, years later when Ernest died. And then when he, and when he passed on. That's when you rekindled your interest? Yeah, I said, well, you know, I know he was an informant. You know, I'd like to find out more. And I knew that, you know, your privacy rights are diminished uh, after you die. That, you know, you always see, you know, when celebrities or important people die, there's always somebody filing a freedom of information request to find out what the FBI had on them. So. So I did that. I you we're going to we're going to talk about the process of the litigation sure. in a moment. But let me just ask Professor Garrow, um, were there other people like Ernest Withers out there, and specifically in the racial informing category, and what motivated them in general? If you if you know, the most important one, certainly in in the King part of the story, uh, was a fellow named Jim Harrison, James A. Harrison, who was the controller, the head finance man. Uh, in the SCLC, Dr. King's organization. Now, the Bureau has never released any documents on Mr. Harrison. Mr. Harrison, as best I know, is still alive. Um, and so the full story there, uh, you know, has not benefited from the sort of really thorough legwork that, that Mark and the Commercial Appeal have done um, on Withers. Um, Harrison was paid. Um, and I think in a majority of, of similar circumstances, I mean, Mark can, can talk about this with regard to Mr. Withers, um, the money involved was modest enough that it was attractive, but money alone at that time was not a motive for being an FBI informant. I think for the majority of, of such people, it was the... Uh, the pleasure, the adrenaline of playing secret agent man, of, of thinking that you were, uh, uh, you know, playing detective, um, you know, and, and, and having, a, a, you know, having a privileged secret role. So I think there's, there's, a, psych, there's a, a sort of, the psychological rewards of being an informant, being a source, um, there was another gentleman who was very active in a, in a variety of r ways around the movement. Uh, J. Richard Kennedy um, actually hosted the national television broadcast the day of the March on Washington with the leaders of the march. Um, Kennedy uh, was talking regularly to the Central Intelligence Agency. Uh, and they were taking his musings about the meaning of the movement all too seriously. Um, so I think for, for some of these individuals, uh, thinking that they had the ear of the FBI or the ear of uh, a part of the CIA, uh, again, had a sort of ego uh, reward or ego boost uh, to, to tell them how important they were. Interesting. Um, let me turn now to uh, Mizell. And uh, Professor Garris talked about how the, uh, having the ear of the FBI was something of interest. How did Mark get the ear, and what would get the ear of the Scripps company to give him the leeway to pursue a story like this for, uh, he's about to tell us the whole story, but he's been pursuing it pretty much doggedly for uh, since 2008 and even before that. It's a 40-year-old confidential informant, isn't that old news? Well, think about it in the context of, of some of the things Mark shared about Ernest Withers, an important local figure you know, a studio on Beale Street. Everybody in Memphis knew 
Ernest Withers, and particularly everybody in black Memphis, a trusted figure. Uh, and, you know, for years, you know, his participation as the photojournalist who chronicled the movement, you know, made him a famous person uh, in, that, uh, in that community. And so uh, the, the idea that Withers uh, may have also been an informant for the FBI and contributing information uh, and, sur and surveillance on, on Dr. King, uh, an explosive story and a timeless story in, in many respects. Uh, and when you put it in a present day context, uh, you know, the federal surveillance of private citizens uh, is an explosive story no matter what. And, and so even years after the fact, uh, and, and that coupled with Mark's persistence uh, and, and, his, uh, and his reporting instincts uh, really got that story on the radar screen for us. We've actually talked in the litigation um, about how this resonates and, and if passed as prologue with the current surveillance, domestic surveillance operations, how can we really understand what our government is doing now if we don't understand the history and kind of examine it in that context and so there's a well absolutely I mean we've we've seen in in, in recent months the uh, re extensive reporting on NSA uh, electronic surveillance uh, but to to David's point uh, earlier uh, that you know in the 60s it wasn't uh, as much about electronic surveillance as much as it was about relationships and and about human uh, human intelligence and uh, so the, the story of how the FBI cultivated those relationships and created that network of, of informants. Uh, and, and the only way to get that story was through the records uh, compiled by the FBI. Um, David Giles, you had to green light, if you will, <coughs> the legal aspect uh, of Mark's work. It costs money, it costs resources. You probably get a lot of requests yeah. from scripts to yep. launch expensive litigation. Yeah. This, this one, you know, I get a lot of requests on a fair, fairly regular basis, and this one, you know, we knew it was going to be an uphill battle. We're taking on the FBI. The FBI is an organization that in FOIA litigation does not often lose. It's one of the frequent winners. Um, but we felt, just like Mark's, the compelling story that Mark's told, that we had a compelling legal story to tell as well that was different than the, um, the, your normal FOIA litigation First of all, we had the compelling story. Uh, we had Mark's legwork. Uh, we had an informant who was no longer alive, uh, and that, uh, as, as Mark discussed a little bit earlier, uh, addressed some of the privacy concerns and other uh, open records concerns. Um, um, there was no reason any longer to withhold this for criminal investigative purposes. You know, the FBI usually, when they prevail in these cases, they can hang their hat, so to speak, on the fact that they're pr protecting life, liberty, safety, happiness uh, in the United States, and they're conducting legitimate law enforcement investigations. But we felt this one was a little bit different and a little bit unique. And so, Mark, um, you did some initial legwork. You did some initial looking into this. Um, there, was, there came a point where you felt comfortable going to print, and it was just before we actually launched the litigation. Right. Tell us where you reached that trigger point. Well, it started with a Freedom of Information request, um, and I had rather you know, naively said in my request I wanted his informant file, but at that time, of course, they weren't even acknowledging that he was an informant. But This is right after he died, This right? is right after, months after he died. He died, in, he died in October of 2007. I filed the request in February of 2008. Okay. So, it took about a year to get something back, and so with the, the, what 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 it was was not anything to do with him being an informant. Um, in the meantime, what had happened with Ernest the sil after the civil rights era waned, um, he got a patronage job working for the state of Tennessee as a essentially a state policeman, a state liquor agent, um, and he got he got caught up in a in a public corruption probe. He'd actually gone to prison. Um, this um, he, he was involved with this cabal of uh, corrupt people in the Ray Blanton administration. I mean, they were, they were selling uh, pardons and clemencies for people like murderers, um, robbers, really severe offenders. I mean, they were anywhere from $10,000 to $80,000 you'd get out of prison. I eventually got these records about Ernest. They came out in, in, in batches over time, but I mean, we've got him on tape. And, 
you know, his phone was tapped. Um, and he, he was very much involved in this, um, in this, um, you know, letting inmates out of, uh, out of, out of prison for, for, for cash. They call it for the, the clemency for cash. Um, and so, how did that fit in? How did that turn you on to the? Well, so the story I had a, I had some records to work with, and this took about a year after I got it. And this body of records that I got initially, I mean, it's hundreds of pages, but initially they only gave gave us like 115 pages. And it was in the course of that they were investigating Ernest. Did, uh, Christine, if you go to the next slide, you'll see this. And this report from 1977 was part of that. Uh, investigation, and if you look at the very bottom down there, this is essentially what I call like a background report. It isn't strictly that, but it gives you background information on Ernest, and, and what it says here is Ernest Columbus Withers was formally designated as ME338R, and it goes on to say, you know, CI. Well, you know, they say just a, a little bit of information is dangerous. In this case, I'd, I'd, <laughs> I'd studied this stuff enough, I, I recognized that number as being an informant number, what they call a source symbol number. And actually, the, the ME, that prefix there, stands for Memphis. 338 was the, the unique number that he was assigned. Any informant, they'll do it sequentially. And so whether you're a criminal informant, a security informant, racial informant, whatever, you're going to get a number, and it's uniquely assigned to you. And the R, that suffix, that was you know, peculiar to the time of you designating him as a racial informant. And so, um, so I had what I thought was a loaded gun, you know, at that point. I mean, I knew, that, all right, this, what this... Guy had told me years earlier is true that he was. And you found this buried, just to be clear, in a buried in the box of documents mm -hmm. for another uh, investigation that involved Ernest Withers. Well, I got it in the FOIA release, the first FOIA release on Ernest, and so I knew I had some traction here. There's something to go with, and so what? But I, w what to do with it? I mean, I couldn't just go write a story that that he was an informant. It really, I mean, it would raise more questions than so. I, and the, the FBI wasn't going to cooperate, so. What I was kind of left with doing was um, I knew that there were other records out in the public domain that had been released years earlier. Um, uh, the FBI's file on the, on the Memphis sanitation worker strike um, and also their like two, three year investigation of the, the invaders, which was a black power group in Memphis um, styled after SNCC or you know, the, the Black Panthers. They, um, uh, th these, these files ran like 7,000 pages and I knew there was a college professor who had them out east. I contacted him. I got him. They were sitting in a basement. I got him to mail it to him when all these boxes come in. And so, and I just start going through it, you know, one by one until I start getting hits. And, and, w and what, the, what the FBI did, uh, what the FBI did is they, they actually failed to redact that, that, that source symbol number, the ME338R. They should have done it. But, they, but the thing is, is that if you, anybody who's been a reporter, People make mistakes, and so they failed to redact it repeatedly. And so, in these older documents that were released in the 70s, sanitation worker strike and uh, and uh, the uh, invaders, I kept finding that number repeatedly. And you could pinpoint specific. You can just when when you see that number, you can just substitute in the name. It's just code, and so you could say uh, like the first hit that I got was um, a teletype that the Memphis field office sent to headquarters in Washington right after Dr. King had died and, and, and they reported that they had an informant at Dr. King's funeral in Atlanta and that the informant was reporting that that a couple of Dr. King's aides uh, were coming back to Memphis to resume their support of the sanitation strike and that was big news for the FBI because they didn't want trouble you know, they didn't right. want outside agitators coming in and um, and the source on the document was ME338R and so this is part of the, 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 the construction of this. The number fits. It's Withers. I knew that Withers was in Atlanta. I knew that he covered the funeral. He shot pictures of Dr. King's coffin, pictures of his widow, Coretta. He was there. And so we and it kept getting things like this. So um, another example is um, in November of 68, um, some campus radicals and militants take over the administration building at Lemoyne Owen College in Memphis. And uh, the FBI's report on it has it, got ME338R all over it. They actually have an index. A lot of these big reports will have an index, and they'll tell you, like, source one is so-and-so, and, -so and it's, it's redacted, and source two is so-and-so, -and, -so and source three. In this case, they failed again to redact ME338R, so I know it's Withers. And he's in the building and providing all kinds of information back to the FBI. And, it, and independently of that, the news coverage of the time, it became clear that Withers people saw Withers go into the building. And so okay. I mean, I've got multiple points of corroboration on this. 
This document became important in the litigation <coughs> along with the last one. What is this particular document? This was a search slip that the FBI released at one time or another. I don't recall exactly when, but it was it added to our um, you know ammunition in, in litigation is that he was uh, at one Let's see, what is that date? It's 78. Okay, so he was under in, uh, investigation by the FBI for public corruption at that time, and somebody requests, you know, they want to see what files they've got on him. This went to Washington, and so all those numbers you see there are different, you know, serials and files that they've got, and, and then at the bottom you see the confidential informant designation, which, um, again, is another point of, of corruption. So we're, we're building toward this story that we eventually did run um, I don't, I'm not sure if that's the next slide or not. Yes, it is. Okay, so uh, this is September of 2010. We still have no confirmation from the FBI, uh, you know, in, in terms of them saying that, you know, articulating it orally that he's an informant. But we have plenty of records and other things, and so we, you know, we run this very long. Uh, it's a seven-page uh, expose that uh, ran in the paper. Um, that basically, and we were able to say in detail things that he had done for the FBI, um, at least from 68 to 70, you know, because um, we didn't have his informant file, so we didn't know the full story of what it was. We followed this up, I think, with another, um, I'm not sure, that this is December, okay, this was December, I did another, <laughs> we did another, um, and basically installment, this was about five pages in the newspaper, but at this point I had um, contacted Betty Lawrence, um, uh, Agent Lawrence's daughter, and uh, she shared with me a number of personal artifacts that he had, including handwritten notes that he'd saved and she saved, and she kept telling me over the phone, you know, you've already proven this, you don't need anything more, but these handwritten notes are just so interesting because and this, the, the part of them you can you can see there, but they refer to Ernest both by name and by his informant number. And at the time that Agent Lawrence wrote these notes, uh, Congress was reinvestigating Dr. King's assassination. This was 1978. Agent Lawrence got called before the Select Committee on Assassinations to testify publicly. And what he says in the notes, and what we now know and believe, is that Ernest was called to testify in secret in closed session. And that's what this is about: his panic about, you know... Agent Lawrence was helping calm him down and prepare him. Yes. He actually coached him on what to say. <laughs> right. And you got access to those notes through, through his Betty. daughter. Right. Who kept him literally in a shoebox. Exactly. These notes are online, by the way, too. They're, um, you know, we... I was in her home scanning all this stuff. It was, uh, all of Mark's work and, and resource materials, you can find them all on the uh, Commercial Appeals website. It's wonderful if you want to see actually how he pieced this whole story together. Myself, let me ask you this. There's a certain um, courageousness just in facing a community like Memphis with a story like this. Ernest Withers was a local hero, and this, in, in, in some ways, uh, casts him certainly in a very different light. Um, what, was there concern? Is there concern about how the story plays in, in the Memphis community? Well, there was certainly a concern and, and, a, and a bit of a backlash, certainly from the Withers family. Uh, over the work that uh, that that Mark uh, Mark had done, and you know, you consider, uh, you always consider the impact of uh, of that reporting on those uh, on those close to the subject of the of the reporting. Uh, that said, uh, you know what you have is this this uh, you know, very detailed uh, paper trail, and we're talking about the we're talking about the paper trail that Mark discovered even before uh, the, the lawsuit uh, is pursued to try to open up the entire file for the, uh, with the, uh, uh, from the FBI. And so, uh, you know, but putting Withers in the context of his times, uh, I think, is, is really, really the challenge uh, in a story like this. And, and telling the full story about, uh, about Ernest Withers, both his work for the FBI, but also uh, what he what he did for the movement as a photojournalist, uh, his efforts really shed light and gave you know real insight and a real human sense to uh, the civil rights movement. And so uh, you know giving his giving his photographs uh, wider wider distribution, I think, has really helped humanize not only him. Uh, but shed a different light on, on those involved in the movement. 
Um, Mark, did you uh, interact with the Withers family? Did you try and source the story with them? Um, yeah, I did. They were when when the story came out. I mean, they were they they were very disturbed by the story. Um, Ernest's daughter uh, said she'd never heard this in her life, and um, at one point they actually said that um, you know basically said I made this up. <laughs> um, but you know, Ernest was a huge figure in Memphis. I mean, he has a, there's a building named after him on Beale Street, and he has a brass. Bull blues note in the sidewalk there, which is the equivalent of the Hollywood star there. I mean, he's very well known, very well liked, and he was a, he truly was a real nice guy. I mean, anybody who, who ever met him, I mean, he was just so pleasant and charming that you would just kind of, you know, juxtaposing the two things, you know, this other side that you know is hidden there and, and, and the criminal prosecution, they just doesn't, don't seem to add up. But um, Ernest was very well liked, and there were there was a lot of um, you know a range of uh, reaction to it. Um, the fam David, did the you meet him when, when you were working on your book? Yes, I, so. I, I have a very clear memory of Mr. Withers coming up to me um, after I'd spoken in Memphis um, sometime in the early 1980s, and he was at this event taking pictures. Um, and I I remember speaking with him, and I remember very clearly him handing me his business card which at that time was on bright yellow cardstock. Um, I, I, I still have it. Um, but as Mark says, it, it, it's just one you know, very small, tiny illustration um, of what a sort of easygoing and ubiquitous figure he was. But as, as the you know, Tennessee gubernatorial Blanton administration corruption story tells, uh, as well, um, you know, Withers is was had a had a, had a double-sided life. You know, he had this wonderful record of achievement as a movement photojournalist, um, and then he has this secret relationship with the FBI and this deeply corrupt role years later. Yeah, an interesting and complicated picture. Um, and so, Dave, the uh, newspaper decided that Mark had taken his story as far as. He could, without the litigation. You all decided to launch into this. Um, what what were the some of the factors going through your mind as far as the challenges? Um, well, I, th I think the challenges were the you know the uh, the fact that uh, the FBI had the full resources of the government behind it, and uh, we did not, mm -hmm. um, and uh, that. Um, you know, there were some e exceptions in the FOIA law that are often interpreted in favor of, of the government. Um, and so those were some challenges that we thought um, uh, we would have to surmount. Um, but uh, Mark is persistent, as you've all, uh, I'm sure, uh, been able to uh, call from this conversation so far. Uh, and after much conversation, we decided that it was worth filing the lawsuit uh, to see if we could shake loose uh, some of the information that um, Mark was seeking. All right, we put up, um, not to bore you all with too much law school uh, detail, but we put up on the screen a couple of provisions that played very heavily uh, in the FOIA litigation. Both of those deal with confidential informants. Right. Dave, talk about the first exemption. Well, the, f the first one is essentially um, a, an exemption for uh, law enforcement records um, uh, that uh, for, for which there's a legitimate purpose to, to keep uh, from public, um, public view. So FOIA gives you a right to government documents, but it has nine large exemptions, and this is part of one of them. Right. And as Dave said, it's for um, confidential informants. So you had an express exemption. Correct. Facing. Correct. Um, but, you know, we felt that, uh, as, I, as I had discussed earlier, some of the uniqueness about this case, the fact that Mr. Withers was no longer alive, uh, the compelling nature of the story, the public interest, uh, we might be able to make a persuasive case uh, that uh, exempt the exemption wouldn't apply. Okay. Now, we originally were going to do a balanced discussion of this because we invited and they accepted the FBI to join us. Unfortunately, the shutdown interceded <laughs> and we could not uh, we could not have somebody to speak for the FBI um, here today. Um, so let me just ask very generally, Professor Garrow, you're involved in a lot of these cases. You study a lot of FOIA litigation. 
what is the general case the FBI makes for historically keeping confidential informant secret? <clears throat> the Bureau, as you've touched upon, has a, a raft of these uh, citations um, in the federal statute that allows them to withhold or redact material. Um, B1, this B7D. Um, but the Bureau generally has adopted a stance of withholding not just all informant identities, but all information supplied by informants. Um, even if the informant is the, you know, Albany, Georgia chief of police, uh, for example. Now, in certainly one very famous instance, and, and there are, are, are others, but let me just use one as an example, um, Jack and Morris Childs, uh, the FBI's most valuable informants of all time, uh, codenamed Solo, uh, who were the financial couriers between the American Communist Party and the Soviet Union, knew the leadership of the Soviet Union, knew the leadership of uh, Communist China, and were working for the FBI for 25 plus years. Now, once the story of the Childs brothers was publicly revealed, uh, and these were super important informants, um, the Bureau made the policy decision that this reflected so well on the FBI that all the documents over time, still going on, have been disgorged. So one can look, many of these are on the web, uh, one can go back and look at what the Childs brothers were doing uh, in the 1950s, traveling to Moscow at the joint behest of the American Communist Party and the FBI. Um, so there's a, a double standard here. That's what I okay. want to emphasize, okay. is that the Bureau will make the decision in some cases uh, to move from a protective uh, to a reputation burnishing approach. Uh, but with an Ernest mm -hmm. Withers, uh, with a Jim Harrison, the informant within Dr. King's organization, uh, unsurprisingly, the Bureau makes the decision uh, that these sorts of recruitments might not reflect so well on the FBI. Okay, and that takes us back to the litigation, actually. The FBI didn't only refuse to give any information, any of the documents about Ernest Withers, they refused to admit or deny that he even was an informant. and we. We had a little surprise in the middle of the litigation that kind of explained the legal basis for that. Yes. yes. They cited, uh, well, the, the, it was a hard-fought litigation. It went over uh, 18 months, and, and as usual, they um, threw the kitchen sink at us. But the surprise that Chuck's talking about was they cited an exclusion um, uh, 2C, which essentially um, allows the government to deny that something exists uh, if it has to do uh, with uh, the the request for an informant's a request submitted uh, via an informant's name or their personal identifier, um, and so you know we were challenged uh, with that e exclusion, uh, but fortunately for us, it had uh, sort of an exemption within it that said uh, that it, this section would not apply if um, the information had been uh, officially uh, corroborated. And so we focused our, our efforts as far as the litigation went on arguing that it had been officially corroborated as well as some other uh, arguments we put up along the way. And so how do we back up our argument on this official corroboration or official confirmation? Well, we went back to the document that we saw earlier and we highlighted earlier where uh, you see uh, Mr. Withers referred to as a former informant uh, it gives his uh, uh, number as ME 338-R. Uh, um, and so we cited that, and we also cited the fact that in filing a response, um, uh, I believe the FBI also uh, submitted that informant number as well. Uh, so there were two examples where uh, it had been, the uh, identity had been, quote unquote, in our minds, officially confirmed. And the FBI actually made the argument that this was not official confirmation, that it was Mark kind of putting things together, and that's therefore that's not official. Um, so we went to hearing on that narrow issue.
Yes. The issue we framed for the judge was, did the FBI, quote, already officially confirm? And what was the judge's reaction? Well, uh, Judge Jackson, um, uh, in, in, a, in a number of instances, ruled in our favor and was one of the reasons that we, there were points along the way during the 18 months when the legal fees are getting high uh, and we're not making a lot of progress, but we would get these rulings along the way uh, that would encourage us that we were making an impact. Um, and in one particular motion uh, ruling, she uh, ruled that exemption C2 or exclusion C2, uh, which I just talked about, did not apply. Um, um, obviously, the, uh, uh, the FBI had argued uh, that um, it, it did apply, uh, but she agreed with us, uh, essentially saying that um, the FBI's position trying to protect this information despite the fact that the, they were not protecting a living informant, they were not protecting a danger or a harm, and, and there were, they were not avoiding details uh, of an ongoing investigation. In essence, she found that they were protecting the government and others from embarrassment, and that wasn't sufficient enough to, to trump the exclusion. One of my favorite lines in that decision also, it's a, a nice published decision is that with regard to their argument that this was not official confirmation because it had too much information redacted to be official, she said that was not worthy of serious consideration, <laughs> that it was very clear to her. Um, and so uh, with C2 out of the way, just the way this works is the FBI was now required and judge basically declared he was a confidential informant. They were required to admit it. And then to litigate the rest of the case with us, they were required to index the file and provide us with an index to the file. And the FBI does not like to even admit that they're confidential informants out there, let alone give you an index to the file, which is the way you fight document by document uh, with the government. And so that became kind of a, a watershed uh, moment for us uh, in the litigation. So. We didn't actually go to a final decision, go to the mat finally, on the ultimate issue of whether we get the, the files. What right. happened? Well, what happened was um, the government, uh, after the ruling that I just described, the, the FBI uh, filed a motion for reconsideration and may have filed, they filed several motions. And uh, Judge Jackson finally, I think, became exasperated with their uh, uh, reluctance not to follow her orders and. Um, she held, uh, she called a status conference. Uh, I was not there, Chuck was there, so he can provide a lot more of the, uh, uh, the elaborate details. Uh, but um, she uh, made it f very clear uh, that the, the government uh, had to comply with the, uh, the order to supply the Vaughn Index. And she also raised the question uh, that perhaps we ought to try and resolve this uh, on our own instead of having her do it. Uh, and I'm gonna, I know this is a little bit tedious, but I'm gonna read a portion of the hearing uh, uh, towards the end where she is addressing uh, uh, the lawyers and she says, maybe all this information is exempt, maybe the information is not exempt. In all likelihood, some of it is and some of it isn't. So the question I have for you today is, who is going to make that decision? Does, that, does it make sense for it to be the two of you instead of me talking to the two lawyers? I'm going to set another status hearing uh, in a month to get the answer. In the meantime, I encourage you to take this back to your respective clients so that you can report back to me the answer to my original question, which is, would this case benefit from mediation? So clearly we got the hint as to what the judge wanted to do. And the interesting thing is, that we had actually started out um, seeking mediation in the beginning, and the FBI flatly refused. And uh, the, the color I'll add to this is, first of all, that hearing that he's quoting from was on the anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech, which was not lost on the judge. She noted the irony of this. And second of all, um, the FBI, in order to continue to block documents entirely, would have to now prove that this was a legitimate law enforcement investigation. And she said rather incredulously, does the FBI really want to take the position that the surveillance of Dr. King was a legitimate exercise of law enforcement 
uh, authority. Um, and she then launched into um, the Solomonic statement that, you know, I'm going to rule half a loaf for some, you all ought to take it back. Um, didn't take us long to get to the mediation no, table after it did that. Not. Yeah, the FBI uh, showed a, a, a real quick willingness. Um, and so what happened next? So um, we had the mediation. We had a couple of meetings um, with a magistrate uh, and, and pretty quickly reached um, uh, terms of an agreement uh, in which um, the National Archives and Records Administration would release documents to Mark um, uh, that had been accessioned to them from the FBI. Uh, it gave Mark uh, the ability to identify 70 files uh, from which he could obtain uh, request documents. Um, and from, I guess, the corporate perspective, they also offered to pay some of our fees. So, so Mark, what was it like sitting in a federal magistrate judge's office looking at a secret list of FBI files and being told you could pick 70 of them and go home? <laughs> well, actually, it was kind of fun. I looked yeah. back at that moment very fondly, sitting around the table. with uh, There were two lawyers from the FBI, two from the Department of Justice, and you and me, so, uh, and the magistrate. But, uh, yeah, um, no, the, the 70 files really speaks to what a prolific informant Ernest Withers was because um, this list they gave us was not all inclusive, and we don't even know. Some of, some of these files, as I understand it, have not yet been accessioned to the National Archives, and so there are some that they're holding on to. We don't know what they are, but they have essentially laid down a list of case files that he'd that he'd worked on, that there were withers related materials on ranging from like the NAACP, the, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. He, he was very, they did an extensive investigation of the SCLC, Dr. King's executive staff, his close people, and Withers was very much involved in that. Um, on and on, I mean, just, and, and I got to pick, you know, <laughs> I got to pick 70 of them, you know, and so, and that's what we did, but I mean, he, it just, again, it speaks to what a prolific informant he really was. Kid in a candy store. That, uh, <laughs> it was really, it was Yeah, really I remember you were sitting there watching me go through a quite list. Quite a moment. Right, watching paint dry on the walls. Well, no, it was very exciting. <laughs> Your face, you were finally getting information well, that's after true. years that's and years, true. and it was very exciting. Let me take a um, real quick detour to just uh, give a shout out. Um, they were not able to help us in the Withers lawsuit, but Dave um, uh, alluded to our attempt to mediate the case before we ever went to mit uh, litigation. The Office of Government Admi is, uh, Information Services is part of the National Archives and Record Administration. Their director was supposed to be here. She's also furloughed out of being here tonight, Miriam Nesbitt. Um, but uh, I just wanted to mention for the journalists and the um, civilians in the audience, uh, OGIS is a, an office that was founded in, early in the first uh, Obama administration. It provides counseling and uh, dispute resolution for citizens. It was part of the Obama initiative toward transparency. We can talk about how transparent the administration is in another panel. But this is, these are good folks in this office who really are there for you to reach out to and to try and help you get recalcitrant agencies to give you their documents. Um, that's their website at the bottom. If we can just take a look at the next slide, just to show you, um, there are over 650,000 FOIA requests each year. Um, 2,000 of them are brought to OGIS for assistance, um, and OGIS also counsels about 1,000 people a year, just in general on the process. So just a quick shout out to our good friends um, uh, at, uh, at OGIS um, who are waiting for your calls. Um, all right, so, uh, Mark, um, you got this information. You got um, you. You were the kid in the candy store, and and the cash <laughs> cash of candy came in. Um, was it worth it? Oh, definitely, <laughs> definitely. So um, we've learned so much about now about what. Even though it was a compromise um, that we reached, and it, it's amazing that you still can compromise in life, and maybe. Some folks here in Washington might want to think about that. But, I mean, compromises <laughs> can work out. And this worked out for the government in that it didn't set any, you know, case law, that um, it was done as a settlement that's off the books, so you can't rely on this as, to build upon it. But it worked out for us because we got uh, I don't know, all these records, but their, their key selling point, uh, Betsy Shapiro from the Department of Justice, the first thing she said is that, she says, you know, we can continue to litigate this, and we will. We're prepared to appeal. I said, but the one thing you didn't get out of the settlement that you wouldn't get, even if you took this all the way to Supreme Court, is photographs. And Ernest Withers was a photographer, 
and the way it's interesting that learning this protocol of how they do things, but um, the way the FBI files things is if you have an informant who's taking pictures, the, they're not filed in the informant file, they're filed in the case file. And so w under this deal, we got access to the case file, Withers related materials in the case file. The deal was they couldn't redact his name, they couldn't redact his informant number, they had to provide, and we worked this out in, in, in the settlement where they had to give us actual photographs, not photocopies of it, back and front, um, and we even had spelled out, you know, the, you know, the pixels or whatever, you know, per, um, just to make sure that they were publishable, you know, and so, um, and so the, one of the first things that we learned in this settlement is, you know, we, uh, they had to give us a statement of, um, because we're never going to get the file, we're never going to get any assignments that he got, any written reports that he did. Um, uh, we're not going to know specific pay records, but in the, in the, when it worked out, the, the settlement is that they were required to tell us the outline, how long did he work. He worked, he first started working for them in 1958 and ended in 1976. The relationship ended then, or shortly before he was indicted. Um, uh, <laughs> he was paid, and this is interesting too, so listen to this full thing. I mean, he was paid over the course of that time authorized to be paid $20,088. Not a huge amount of money, but think about it on a, on a couple of levels. First, you know, in today's money, that's about $130,000. But then think, too, that most of the people who cooperated with the FBI got paid nothing, zero. And so he was actually very well compensated by their <laughs> in their world. Um, we don't know exactly when that pay came. We suspect that most of it came in this very prolific period when you know Memphis started, you know all hell started breaking loose in Memphis. Um, you had the sanitation worker strike, Dr. King getting shot there. You had you know the SCLC coming back time and time again, leading you know strikes against the hospital, you know the, to unionize the hospital and desegregation strikes. And so he became very very useful then. But he was useful to them throughout that whole, you know that whole arc. And 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 it, there's different phases of, of his informant work. Like in 58 to 61, it's still pretty much unknown what he was doing for them. Um, we haven't, I have, have not seen any records from that period yet. I do know that he had, that it shows up in some of these records that Ernest had a 137 file, which would make him at one point a, a criminal informant, straight up criminal informant, somebody who would, you know, rat in somebody who was doing things illegally. So I suspect that that's probably what was going on in that early period. But then he starts becoming a political informant, and, um, and, and starting in 61, the records that we've got so far, and we're going to get these records over the course, we're getting them in, in batches over two years. So, um, and we've got a whole bunch so far, but we're, there, there, there's a lot more we haven't seen. But so far, um, he, he starts becoming a political informant in 1961, and what you had going on then, the, the Nation of Islam had opened a mosque in Memphis. They became active in the South, and that just really concerned the FBI. Um, you had um, the, the civil rights movement was gearing up. I mean, you had sit-in uh, protests and some, you know, some mass marches in Memphis for desegregation. Um, you, you also had, uh, they were sending Ernest out into the hinterlands because you had these, um, what they called tent city operations where uh, sharecroppers who had been kicked off their land either by mechanization or by, um, you know, re trying to register to vote. Mm. They were basically living like political refugees, like something out of, you know, John Steinbeck's Graves of Wrath. And, and they were, there were the outside agitators who were coming into the camps from the north and from Memphis that the FBI viewed very suspiciously as being, you know, socialists, communists, leftists. And so, and that's what they were they got Ernest to, to report on that. And so he morphs from, you know, probably a criminal informant to a political informant in the mid-60s. He's, like, reporting very intensively on the, um, the um, peace movement. And then toward the end, it's, you know, the, the whole militancy, you know, the, the black nationalist movement. Um, and so um, it's interesting, too, that and, and the, the kind of the different roles that he served, too, that are becoming clear in these is that he was an intelligence gatherer. He, he, he got information about, you know, strategy meetings that he passed on to them, passed on leaflets, um, financial reports, um, and a lot of cases like, you know, phone numbers, things that helped him. He, he also helped them catalog the movement, which is interesting because of him being a photographer. He was able to go out and get a lot of group pictures. Let's take a look at some of the, yeah. the pictures. Yeah. Well, here, um, if, go back one second, if you don't mind, because I, I know I'm kind of rambling on here, but this, 
was Ernest's imprint, and, and his slogan was, pictures tell the story. And was that, <laughs> was it on the card, oh, yes. David? Yes, yes. <laughs> wonderful. Um, he, he, Ernest actually has three uh, coffee, coffee table style picture books that I, I believe one of them is called picture tell the, Pictures Tell the Story. But this was his imprint that showed up on the back of, this is one of the reasons we wanted, you know, and, and to stipulate in the settlement, we want the front of the photo and the back of the photo. And so, and here, before they, before they made him ME330ER, that imprint kept showing up. This picture here is from the, taken in 1964 from the first mosque on Beale Street. They'd actually opened, the Nation of Islam had opened a mosque in 61 and had been active there, but you know, Ernest had a studio right down the street and he went down there and took this picture. Um, and and uh, what, you, what he would do is he'd get the picture and he'd get as much information. You can just almost imagine, you know, journalists, you know, when you go out or if you're a photographer, what's your name, what's your occupation, you know, and, and he would do all this under the cover of being a journalist and they would write down, I believe that's Agent Lawrence's handwriting on the back and, and Ernest might have told him, I don't know, but, but um, he, he would get their names, addresses when he had them, ages, occupations, a lot of times nicknames, um, and they would write all this and sometimes they would cut these photos up as they needed to, like for mug shots or whatever, to put into individual, if they were keeping a file on an individual. Um, and so, you know, that was his, that was his, his role as cataloging and inventory and helping them identify, you know, who, the who's who, really, of these movements. Let's take a look at this next image. There's an interesting story here. Okay. Well, this takes us to the investigation of, uh, the FBI's investigation of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. The FBI, for some reason or another, and I'm talking about the FBI's Memphis field office, they were never deeply concerned about Dr. King. They opened a file on him in 1965, and it's thin. I, I mean, I've got it. There's some interesting things in there, but we won't go into that now. But, but they were very disturbed with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and it had to do with that whole period from 1967 when Dr. King came out against the war and he was view viewed as this very dangerous radical. People don't think of that now, but I mean, he was viewed as a militant. And, and a lot of the people around him, you know, he's having meetings with Stokely Carmichael, people on his staff, Jesse Jackson, they view as being very militant, a lot of the activists in Memphis. And so it's in that context that Memphis field office really starts zeroing in on him. And he keeps, him and his executive staff keep coming back to Memphis. And then they have that big riot there and Dr. King, trying to shore up, you know, and have a peaceful march, is starting to meet with some of the local militants. And what the, his, his only objective is to try, to try to get them on board. We need a peaceful march. And he starts really, starts cutting deals with them. I mean, essentially what he's doing, he's talking with them in Lorraine, really in the hours before he's shot. And, you know, he's saying that we'll, we'll make you secure parade marshals for the next march here. And we'll also, when we go to Washington, um, you will be, you know, involved in the security there. And after Dr. King was shot, they did the invaders and this activist named Sweet Willie Wine um, became the, the the police of Resurrection City. But so they're working out this deal, and the SCLC keeps coming back to Memphis after Dr. King is shot, and they have their annual convention in August of '68 there, and these young militants storm the the the, the, the convention. And they come in with a, they've got a, some kind of flag with them, and they're just, uh, they really take it over and they, they confront Andrew Young and Ralph Abernathy. And they say, you know, Dr. King made all these promises to us, and we want to get paid for it. And under pressure, they wrote out a check. And it's kind of interesting, the urban myth of this, so that when talking to different people, is that the way that activists remembered is that they, it was for $10,000 and that Dr. King wrote it out for them, you know, in the hotel, you know. So, but when you work through the story, and here's the actual picture, they got Withers to go take a picture of this check. It was for $500. And uh, David, Professor Garrow, actually helped me through this because when I was interviewing Andrew Young on this, he's, you can't read who signed that check. And I'm going, and he's going, I don't know anybody. Andrew Young's saying, no, there's nobody who fits that description. Professor Garrow has got a photographic memory. Remember that Cirillo McSwain, and that's McSween, who, yes. McSween, yes. yes. Who was that, David? Yeah, he was. He was a you know lesser figure within the SCLC world. You know, someone who who emerges, uh, you know, as as a more prominent figure in the organization after Dr. King's death. You know, when Ralph Abernathy has succeeded King. But again, this is you know it, it's wonderful. You know how all of these uh, documents and images. Uh, show just how broad a coverage Mr. Withers was giving the FBI, sure. not just of, you know, SCLC, 
um, but the you know the the local black militants in Memphis. It's 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 the breadth of coverage that the FBI had in city after city after city of all sorts of social political protest activism in the in the late sixties going into the early seventies. Let's take a look at some more of uh, what Ernest was uh, was documenting. You all recognize this man. <laughs> Maybe yeah. maybe they won't because he's so he looks so young there. He does. He he's very young there. This this he's wearing a denim jacket. This clearly was taken. I, you know the date on this. I'm not sure that came through. It, it looks like a Polaroid. But one of the things that we understand they did is that Ernest would go out and take pictures of, of individuals, and then the FBI for some reason would take another Polaroid of the picture. Why they would do that, who knows? But that and that was their copy of it. But this is during the Poor People's Campaign. They're organizing um, poor people in Mississippi to march to Washington. And so, and the FBI, a lot of times you wonder, so well, what, you know. We should say this is Andy Young. Andy Young, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Just, just so people aren't Andy in, Young. in mystery. But why would they take a picture of Andy Young? There's millions of pictures of him. And so, but why? But you know, one of these things that the FBI did was this, kind of this vacuum cleaner approach. They just take so much stuff because they didn't know when they need it. And this is a very interesting picture. I love this picture. and. Uh, Take a good look at this. this. This is Father Charles Mahoney. This was taken in 1968. And, you know, in, in, in the context of today, you might think, well, wow, was he under investigation for some, you know, <laughs> as a predator or something? No, it had nothing to do with it. His only crime was uh, um, ex freedom of expression and association, really, is what it is. Um, he was uh, part, uh, he and some other priests were part of this Paulist order. Uh, at St. Patrick's Catholic Church in downtown Memphis, and they had an outreach ministry to some of the black militants who actually had an office right near them and would let them share office space. They were very sympathetic to the, the sanitation workers' strike, the movement. They were anti-war. The FBI started looking at these priests very suspiciously. They kept fighting. There was he had a, a colleague, uh, Doctor, uh, uh, not Doctor, uh, Father William Greenspun, who I've found now. They had I haven't seen the file yet, but they kept file on him. And this file, this picture here wound up in, the, the FBI wanted a picture of all these guys. They took, they got pictures of all these priests, and this one wound up in the invaders file, but they have, they haven't tapped it yet, but they had, a, they had a file on Father William Greenspan that's now passed on. So, I mean, this is interesting, um, the, you know, the, the lengths that they were willing to go to, to investigate this. This photo here is from 1962, and this was when they dispatched uh, Ernest into the tent city camps. This man on the right is an activist. Um, I don't think he's very well known. I think his name is uh, Weinberger, um, but he came down from Connecticut to uh, to basically was seen as an outside agitator. He was helping some of the women in the camp make leather bags. Tote, they call them tote bags for integration. Yeah. But he, but he was also connected to. Um, I, I believe it was CORE, the Congress for, for Racial Equality. You know, the FBI, local FBI viewed that very jaundicely. They wanted, he, he had gone to jail. He just bailed out, in this photo, he had just bailed out of jail for speeding, and he refused to pay his ticket for some reason. And, but the FBI wanted photos, wanted information on it. And it's interesting, too, that, that they specifically sent uh, Ernest into this camp under the cover of him as a journalist. Um, they, they noted in the reports, and this is where you see, uh, said that um, Agent Lawrence is right in this, that, that Withers is a commercial photographer, self-employed. He has credentials for Jet Magazine, a Johnson Publishing Company publication. He previously has done picture stories for Jet in both Fayette and Hay Haywood counties and was the first newsman to do uh, stories in Fayette County uh, regarding the tent city. He says, thus he would have logical entree and pretext to make inquiries around the current tent city tent city and they were inquiring about some people connected to the Socialist Workers Party. Fantastic. And so that's, and, and it's interesting too, and we'll talk about this photo in a second here, but similarly uh, as the peace movement geared up there, they sent Mr. Withers out again and um, uh, in this, in a, in a report related to that, they noted that that Withers, quote, has a press card for Jet Magazine and another for the Tri-State Defender. He said he's agreed to cover the proposed march. Uh, Withers agreed that he would cover this posing as a newsman, but would be alert to, to photograph every participant in the march, including identification-type photos with good facial views. And that day, the file showed 
the, fi the report that they filed that day, he added, um, he added uh, pictures to five new files and 16 existing files. So, wow. Um, this so tell us about this one. All right, this photo right here, the man in the center, the man with the beard and, and balding is, is James Bevel of Dr. King's executive staff. This was taken March 20th, 1968, about two weeks before Dr. King's assassination in Memphis, and this is that period of time when they're very concerned about the SCLC. Ernest filed a report that day about a speech that James Bevel had made at Lemoyne College. Um, it was viewed by the FBI as being very inflammatory. He supposedly was endorsing the Black Power Movement. These men around him are, are young militants who were, you know, you know, very much part of the Black Power Movement, and um, and so th this really got the FBI worked up. I mean, and having these pictures, there were numbers of pictures of, of Bevel that that he took that day and submitted. And it's interesting too that these things have been sitting in FBI files sealed for 40, 50 years. It's amazing. Just, just to yeah. see them. All right, now this is another interesting photo, and um, really this gets into an area that that I would label like a, a, a COINTEL Pro type operation. Even though uh, I don't know if y'all know what, what is COINTEL. COINTEL Pro was the FBI's dirty tricks cam you know uh, campaign where they would try to undermine or disrupt movements um, by you know by putting out negative publicity on somebody or trying to trying to disrupt their employment. And this, these reports were never labeled. The COINTELPRO was an official program and it, that they had, but a lot of the stuff that they were doing, I found, weren't part of the COINTEL program, right. but they were COINTELPRO-like. Mm -hmm. And this is a good example of it. This lady here is Rosetta Miller. She was an employee of the U.S. Civil Rights Commission in Memphis, which at that, at that time was headquartered there in Memphis. And she was deemed by the local FBI as being too sympathetic with the militant movement. And so they start getting reports on, on, on her from Ernest. And Ernest tells them that she's the kind who will give aid and comfort to, you know, the militant movement and also passes on a rumor that says that she's, you know, basically low character. She had a, had a one-week marriage, you know, with, <laughs> I interviewed her recently. She's a very nice lady. And, and uh, but they got her to take, uh, uh, Got it. This is the picture that he took too. They wanted the identification. They wanted to be able to say, "This is her." And who knows how they plan to use this eventually? But one of the things is, is that she and her coworker both contend that the FBI tried to get them fired from their jobs at the U.S. Civil Rights Commission. Bobby Doctor, right. who uh, who I've interviewed extensively about this, and he's maintained this for years, not just now when this has come out. Bobby Doctor who was a field worker for the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, says the FBI, uh, they were in the same building in downtown Memphis, delivered like an inch thick report on his activities. He was deemed too sympathetic to the militant movement, wanted him fired. Um, they actually got pictures of Bobby Doctor, and we don't have the picture yet, but it's in the files, and I hope we get the picture, because a lot of these pictures are referenced, but you don't, Lord knows where they are. So here's an illustration of their uh, concern about the Nation of Islam. Yeah, let me just say, finish about Bobby Doctor. Oh, sure. Ernest Withers got a picture of Bobby Doctor holding hands with another woman, evidently at some rally, and I've interviewed him about him, and he, he knew her, but they're saying, they note in the report that they're both married to other people. They're not married to each other. What they were going to do with the photo, you can only surmise. I don't know. We, we haven't been able to track all that down, but they were very much after him, and he was, and again, he was a government employee who they deemed too close to the, uh, to the militant movement. Um, this photo here um, is of a, I'm trying to remember this guy's name, Bolden Eugene Lawson is his name, and he was a, uh, a young cleric for the Nation of Islam. This is taking us back to 1961 when they, First became active, they opened a mosque and a makeshift mosque in South Memphis, and uh, and again, I mean, you know, Ernest would go in there, take the pictures. He'd have the you know flip photo, he'd have the identifications, you know, the names, ages, when he could get them, occupation, that sort of thing. And so I think I think it bears bears adding to Chuck bef before we run out of time. Sure. You know what what a remarkable you know unintended but remarkable historical archive. Yeah the FBI created. Yeah. Now, some of this, you know, some of this, thanks to Mark and, and uh, Scripps, you know, we now have. But, you know, this is just one part of a much larger iceberg uh, that the government still has. Um, and particularly in the informant context, you know, where the, where the Bureau and the Justice Department's position is, that they'll protect some of these facts of government activity forever, 
um, you know, there's the danger that, that big pieces of American history uh, the government never wants to have told. And you know, that's interesting because this next coupling of photos, let's stay on this one for a minute, <laughs> will show you how the efforts of Mark and, and litigation can kind of lower the waterline so you can see <laughs> more of that iceberg. This is a picture that uh, contains uh, no faces, obviously, and it has the notation B7C and uh, B6. Those are notations for privacy interests in FOIA litigation. And so as an initial matter, Mark, you did not get to see the, the faces of these people, is that right? Not initially, because what happened was um, this file came from the FBI. This is, this was the, the Nation of Islam file um, was one that had not been accessioned to NARA. And so under this deal we worked out, um, we, the, the FBI agreed to release it. So the FBI, sometime earlier this year, <coughs> released this photo and, and, and other photos from you know, what, what Ernest Withers was taking of the Nation of Islam, and they redacted every name and every face. And we got upset about that, and Chuck made a call to Betsy at the Justice Department, and we eventually got NARA, the National Archives, to re-release the photo. Now here's the, here's <laughs> the photo we got. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? And there it is. NARA yeah. is much more accommodating and doesn't take this strict interpretation, I've found, to the same degree that Well, you know, is. and also you've mentioned her by name, Betsy Shapiro, two other lawyers uh, worth noting on the Department of Justice side, Wendy Doty, Leslie Farby. You know, litigation doesn't get resolved in mediation without willing participants, people who come to the table in good faith. And I will say, in my experience litigating for many years against the Department of Justice, we've never seen a real effort to come to the table uh, in good faith as much as we did with these lawyers from the Department of Justice and their FBI counterparts. We don't have to get into all the detail of what we talked about, but there were a lot of nice things said to Mark in recognition uh, about the importance of his work. Let me give a quick shout out also to Christine Waltz of my law firm and Drew Shankman, uh, two of the hardworking media lawyers at Holland and Knight who were very involved in uh, our side of the litigation and who put together late at night, huddled over research materials, the papers um, that led to, uh, to all of this. Um, there is one aspect of this story that also came out in the papers um, that we received, uh, Mizell, that we might want to just spend a minute talking about. If we could take a look um, uh, in, in this, I'm sorry, just to, I jumped ahead for a second, just to show you, these are some of the works and the stories that Mark has produced as a result. Maybe we'll come back to that as our closer. But um, I saw there's one series of documents uh, that actually came out in this litigation about the commercial appeal, your newspaper, your company's newspaper, Mark's newspaper, back in the 1960s and its cooperation with the FBI. What, what, what is the Scripps' um, attitude on well, that? Well, actually, what you had there were uh, uh, reporters from the Press Scimitar, which was the Scripps-owned newspaper in Memphis during that period of time, um, as well as the Commercial Appeal, which at that time was not owned by Scripps, uh, that uh, were uh, deemed friendly by the FBI. The reporters for the newspaper were uh, pursuing stories on the Black Power Movement uh, and other activities. And uh, in the documents, uh, their, uh, their work was, was characterized as, as being sympathetic uh, to the interests of, uh, of, of the FBI. Uh, and uh, that uh, sources within uh, the newspaper were, were giving information to, to the FBI. And so there's, there's a lot to be learned in retrospect well, you know, there are a couple of, there are a couple of things to, to, to really consider here. Uh, one is, uh, you know, both, uh, you know, Mark and, and David have both commented about uh, the wide network of people in and around Memphis who were giving information uh, to, uh, to authorities and this extensive human intelligence network that had been, uh, that had been created. Uh, and, and the documents revealed that journalists were also, uh, some journalists were also part of, of that network. Uh, and, and I think that's a, that's a story that needs to be told and needs to be told in much more detail. Uh, and, uh, and it will uh, in the future. And, and Memphis wasn't unique. Absolutely. <clears throat> we, one can see the same thing, not as, not as well documented, St. Louis, 
Birmingham. Um, so again, there's, there's a bigger iceberg uh, out there uh, than, than what we so far know. And when we look at, and, we, and when we consider that, that period of time in our history, uh, you know, journalists uh, in many cases were part of the local establishment. Yes. You know, Watergate was the was 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 the the the, the tipping point where uh, the more adversarial uh, st uh, style of of journalism uh, came uh, came about, and you 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 saw a lot of journalists recoil at the relationships that had been commonplace in the '60s. Well, it took um, you know good faith coming to the table and Mark being able to be persuaded that he could tell his story. Uh, and, and tell Ernest Withers' story in the fullness that he could. It also took some kind of discussion about money, is that right, <laughs> Dave? Because this was right. an expensive lawsuit. Yes, it was expensive litigation. Uh, and there were times when um, uh, the folks paying the bills were uh, asking a lot of questions about where we were headed, what, uh, what it was going to cost. And um, uh, uh, with Mark's help and with the... Uh, um, sturdy leadership both at the newspaper and with folks like Mizell, uh, we were able to stay stay focused on the goal, which was to gather up this information. Uh, I think some of the rulings that we had along the way that gave us hope uh, that we were headed in the right direction also kept us um, interested in moving forward um, and, and uh, a belief that the, the ultimate goal was worth, worth the cost in, in the end. Uh, now, uh, granted, we were reimbursed about 80% of our, our legal fees, so that helped in the end, but um, I think the focus during the litigation was more on uh, doing the right thing and getting the information uh, than it was on the cost. I think that's a, that's a, that's a real important point as we you know, think about the, you know, the state of the media and, uh, and, and the expense of litigating cases uh, like like this, uh, and, but even when you take it down to the local level, uh, you know there 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 are opportunities for media organizations to recover portions and in some cases all of their legal fees uh, if they happen to be uh, if if they emerge from those battles uh, victoriously and uh, and and I think that 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 tends to be forgotten uh, by 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 some. Uh, uh, some uh, media companies when uh, you know when we're looking at you know really our business being remade as we speak yeah, absolutely well we've been talking for a uh, couple of hours now and we wanted to make sure that we just gave you all an opportunity do people have some questions for the panel all right um, we're gonna pass a microphone around would you um, when you post your question would you state your name and if you have an affiliation or an organization, please let us know who that is. We'll start with this, um, this uh, Christine, if we could start with this lady in the second row over here. Uh, yes, my name is Dorothy Gilliam. I'm a former reporter for the Washington Post. I actually worked with Ernest Withers on a story while I was with the Post. So my question to you is, um, one of my questions was going to be how far back you, uh, you uh, saw this this work, and uh, you know the fact that he actually worked back starting back in '58 was a sh a sh another shock to me tonight. Um, did he? Did you find any indication that he reported on the reporters with whom he worked to the FBI? Well, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I'm gonna have to pull this out of the recesses of my mind here, but I think uh, does the name Carl Blois ring a bell? Does to me, it's high hard to, yeah. He, I think he's still around. I, I apologize. I mean, some of the, I mean, there's so much information that I've gathered. He, he was, he was a journalist. Um, I, th I believe he was. I believe he worked for. I don't. I don't want to say this wrong. Maybe the the Daily Worker. Is that possible? It's it's one of it's one of the the lefty political papers. That's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Yes, I recognize it as. And a there were that. others like that. There was, um, boy, this is just. Um, there was a, a, a lady who worked for the New York Amsterdam News who made a trip through Memphis. I can get you her name later, who Ernest reported on when she came through. Um, I can't remember the name. Um, they were concerned because of her political views. 
and they were down there, her and her husband. Her husband was some wealthy uh, real estate executive or something, and they were down there to essentially survey the state of integration, and for some reason or another, she really got the, <laughs> the FBI worked up. Dorothy, you worked with Ernest Withers on a story? Sure, sure, sure. But the point was, look, I'm here to tell you that I have come to show you that there is this work. Fantastic. That's great. Um, any more questions, please? We had some more hands up. This, this lady over. Okay, let's take one from over there. With the length of time that this went on, and surely, you know, you have some intelligent, educated people in the FBI, and the, the depth at which they were looking at this movement, did you, did you find any evidence that anybody said, stepped back at some point and said, you know, these people are pushing for legitimate civil rights in the United States. That's the real thrust of the movement, no matter what little side things are going on. Did anybody say that? Oh yeah, they did. Um, there, was a, there was a businessman in Memphis, a white businessman who ran a car dealership, John T. Fisher, and he was one who was deemed too sympathetic to the movement, and particularly the militant wing of the movement, and the, he shows up in different reports. He passed on recently, but he, I, I've interviewed him and others have too, and he talks, you know, he's very uh, adamant about the FBI coming to him and trying to lean on him. He shows up in reports as, like, you know, offering jobs to young activists. And, and they, did, they were trying to disrupt this movement. They didn't like that. And he was one who really stood up and said, you know, we're not doing anything wrong here. I mean, I think the, the, the priests at St. Patrick's were like that, too. I mean, they, they, they were anti-war. They were, you know, pro-people. <laughs> You know, they had this urban outreach. Is there anybody in charge of the FBI? The FBI. Considering the amount of, considering, was there anybody within FBI, the FBI, considering the amount of surveillance they had? Well, Betty Lawrence has told me that her, her father was actually very pro-civil rights. I don't see that. One of the things about the FBI is that they never saw themselves as being anti-civil rights. What they were trying to do, what their agenda was is to keep the country stable, investigate unrest. And even when we were sitting down at, at in mediation, they refer to these as criminal investigations. It's like they, they kind of veered off course, though, you know, these abuses. And so I don't think that they, within the FBI, saw what they were doing. They were protecting the country. That was their view. And like a lot of it got out of hand, but that's what they saw themselves doing. They were trying to keep law and order. Um, there was a lot, I mean, in the context, too, um, you know, from the mid-60s, uh, there were, uh, you know, the, a lot of big riots in the big cities, which really, a lot of, a lot of the activism was going on. They were, that, that was one thing that they were fearful of was, you know, this, you know, disturbance and destruction of property, loss of life. I think in the, I think in the, in the, in the larger context beyond just the Memphis story, uh, the fundamental answer to the, to the question you pose is no. Um, that within the Bureau, uh, there was no uh, culture of, uh, of tolerating, never mind welcoming, uh, any sort of dissent. Um, and I think that's going to be true in, in any sort of, of police or, or intelligence agency. Um, we've seen some, some examples in, in recent years um, that we don't have time to go into here at all, of, of whistleblowers um, from within some government intelligence agencies um, who have have uh, you know been criminally prosecuted and, and convicted um, uh, you know for for daring to dissent um, from that organizational uh, mission consensus you find a few field agents back in this day uh, who in retrospect, Acknowledge they had private doubts about the rightness of this, uh, but they, without exception, uh, say, I kept my mouth shut. Do you, Mark, and, and you and I have had some conversations about this, what motivated Ernest Withers 
Um, there was the money, we now mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. but was there something else that plays into this whole mission Yeah, I idea? think he, he, like so many people, when you look at, you know, major events in your life, he had, he had mixed motives. And we'll never know precisely what they were, but, I mean, money was a factor. He had eight children to feed, and, in fact, my original source told me that that's what it was. It was about the money, but he, he, wanted, I, he wanted to be a cop. I mean, that was his lifelong goal. In fact, he was a cop twice. Oh, actually, three times. <laughs> he was uh, a Memphis police officer in 1948 to 51 and wound up getting fired for taking kickbacks. And then, of course, he was a state policeman in the late 70s, and he went to prison for that. He was also elected as Shelby County Constable, which was this unpaid you know, position that really didn't everything. He almost, when, when Jimmy Carter became president, um, he was on a short list to be nominated for U.S. Marshal in Memphis. And mm -hmm. so... This is one of the things that he probably wanted to be a cop more than he wanted to be a photographer. It just didn't work out for him. But, but so that was it. Law enforcement interested him. It was the money. And also, uh, he, was, he was a conservative guy. I mean, he was from a different generation. He, he fought in World War II. And so when a lot of this you know, unrest coming on, he very much supported the NAACP approach, you know, which was litigation, the, the whole you know, direct action thing and the mass marching and how it all... I mean, he, I, I think he had... He, he was opposed to that, and he was a conservative. So that factors into so there it, may too. have been a, a, a nobility of patriotism or something. Exactly. I think he was patriotic. Yeah. He definitely was. Fascinating. Quest more questions? How about somebody over here? Hi, Carol Gunsberg, and I'm with Scripps Howard News Service here. Just a simple question. I wondered what um, your relationship is or whether you've heard from the Withers family and uh, to the extent that they might acknowledge um, Mr. Withers' involvement with the FBI and how much they've expanded on what he did or didn't do. We, we, we have, we don't really talk. I mean, they were very angry with me for a long time. I did have a civil conversation with uh, Roz Withers, his daughter, about a year ago. Um, you know, as I've told her, I don't think that this in any way diminishes Ernest's legacy. I mean, I think anything he, I mean, that you look at the seminal photos he took of the civil rights movement, getting that message out and helping to publicize it, it trumps all this. It's just kind of this hidden history that, you know, we had to bring out. Um, their position has morphed over time. It was initially denial. I mean, you're making this up, you know, it's, you know, to now they, they've accepted it in a way. The last time I heard any published comments from her, she basically said that, that he took photos for the FBI just as he took photos for other clients. It's kind of the position they've settled on in this. Of course, he did a lot more than that. I mean, he, he provided a lot of, you know, oral intelligence that was put into reports and whatnot. But, but I mean, it, the position has morphed over time. Gene, let's wait for a microphone. Hi, I'm, I'm Gene Polisinski with the uh, First Amendment Center. About a year and more ago, I think, in Nashville, there were some family members, and they raised an aspect of motivation now that you've touched on it, which was the coercive um, presence of the FBI in visiting Ernest Withers when it started. And you may have heard this from different family members that um, even though you've cited some money that came in, it was over a long period of time, that he basically had this family photo business, that it wasn't hand to mouth, but that, you know, there was an economic uh, pressure there with a large family and that uh, there was, if not a direct and implied, uh, you know, you can be with us or you can be against us kind of a, of a thing. And I'm just curious, that was pre any of these documents that you've read. Mm -hmm. And I'm not giving any credence to that particular theory, but just curious whether any of that's been touched on anything you've read mm -hmm. so far. Yeah, I've heard that. And as a matter of fact, the story, the one of the sons said is that, that an FBI agent came in and basically tore up Ernest's studio one day and was yelling at him something. I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. When you look at the close, friendly association that, that Bill Lawrence had with Ernest Withers. He, he brought Ernest into his home, and he, they took Christmas photos of his family. Um, when, when Bill Lawrence testified before Congress, somebody, I think it was Walter Fontroy, asked him on, you know, when he was testifying whether you know, he'd ever flipped some you know, criminal defendant as an informant. He says, I've never done that in my life. He worked in a different world. Now, I mean, I, I don't... 
he was he was a sec domestic security guy, and he would go out and he would recruit people. He was a, a salesman for the FBI. He he one of the ways that he recruited Vasco Smith and the NAACP was they both had a deep interest in jazz, and he sold that to bring them on board. So I don't I've heard that story. I don't believe it. I don't think it's true. Good question. Question in the back, Sophia. Hi. Um, I'm Sophia Cope with the Newspaper Association of America, and EW Scripps is a member of ours, so I'm really happy to hear that you guys pursued this, uh, this story and this litigation. Um, Mark, I'm wondering, what documents do you still want, and do you think the FBI will sort of voluntarily give them to you, or do you think that further lit litigation will be necessary? Well, that's a good question, and there are a as I'm going through these records, there are references to a lot of photos, I alluded to this earlier, that that aren't part of the public domain yet and may never ever become part of the public domain. And um, for example, um, some of the early pictures that Ernest took at Tent City um, were of James Foreman, who at that time, this was early, 1961, the records show that he was selling the FBI, he sold them seven pictures of James Foreman for a dollar each. and. It was, and, and it wasn't worked out yet. He didn't get coded as ME338R until later in the relationship. They tried to make him a full-fledged paid informant early on. He couldn't pass the reliability standard because of what happened in the Memphis Police Department, so they made him the next best thing, which was a confidential source, which was, he was an informant. They just called him something else, and they had a different arrangement. But there's lots of references to, to photos that he, photos he took of Fannie Lou Hamer. We don't have them. Where are they? I mean, just, an, lots of people you know that it would be interesting if somehow there was some mechanism where you could get your arms around this sort of litigating and fighting you know and but I don't know what that is <laughs> gentleman in the front get a microphone up here please hi my name is Tony Deaconess uh, we've talked mm, yes <laughs> um, I uh, work with Ernest from 1990 and acted as his agent. I was uh, totally blown out of the water when I saw his, the, the breadth of the work that he had done. What I find really interesting is you're referring to those pictures of uh, Nation of Islam, uh, the defenders. Uh, it's too bad you don't have a better working relationship with the family because all of those negatives are accessible. All of those prints are accessible. Uh, they were, you know what I think, Ernest uh, saw an opportunity perhaps working with the FBI to double dip. You presented a story where uh, Ernest posed as a journalist. He was a journalist. And those photographs, the March Against Fear, uh, Tent City, those, I, I venture, I put money on the table that those pictures were published in many of the African American dailies. And if the FBI were to supplement his income to pay more, Ernest would have taken it. Uh, you know, he needed the money, but uh, I, there's, I, and I think this is why the family's upset, is because you s make a statement that Ernest Withers was an FBI informant. Well, that's a lot of baggage. And I haven't heard anything about uh, real substantive harm that Ernest caused any individuals other than this innuendo that he was an FBI informant. Did he somehow slander people? Pictures of Fannie Lou Hamer, he's got dozens of them. Uh, James Farmer, dozens of them, some of which have been exhibited in museums and in galleries around the country. What was he hiding? Th there was nothing to hide if somebody wanted a picture you knew about this for a long time, Mark. Why didn't you go talk to him? Ernest loved to talk about I his did. life, including some of these horrendous mistakes he made. Mm -hmm. I did talk to him. Um, we didn't talk specifically about that. This didn't come out until after he died. Um, as, I, as I said earlier, we never, I never envisioned that I was going to write this story once you know, the, my original source wasn't going to go on the record on that. But I mean, as far as the possible harm, I mean, when you get, there are areas that, you know, we discussed about, you know, the COINTELPRO type operations that, that 
they were doing. Uh, the, the workers at the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, Rosetta Miller, Bobby Doctor, you know, taking pictures of them, showing them holding hands, the FBI trying to get them fired. I mean, there's a whole other dimension to this. The Catholic priests, I mean, what were they doing? I mean, they were just doing an urban outreach ministry. And so, I mean, there are, you're right to a point. I mean, there was this kind of this double dipping. So a lot of these photos were published. Some weren't. I think probably, you know, as we get more, we're finding more, more weren't. But there was that other element. There was that other element of the dirty tricks that were going on, the abuses that really um, reach further. And I think, again, I mean, I don't think it will diminish his legacy as, a, as a, an important documentarian of the, of the civil rights movement, but I think it adds another dimension where you really have to question what he was doing. Yeah. And in, 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 in instances beyond Mr. Withers, this pattern is the same thing, that the human informants are crucial to the FBI's ability to do all of these personally harmful, dirty tricks, whether it's the Communist Party, whether it's people working in SCLC headquarters. Um, one often, retrospectively, hears this excuse of, oh, you know, I wasn't, my father, my husband, whoever the informant was, wasn't, try wasn't trying to harm anyone. Sorry, that is unacceptably naive. This was a system of police intelligence designed to harm people whose politics the FBI found offensive and imaginably dangerous. I'll also add, thank you for your contribution, by the way. I think you added a very important voice to today's discussion. I'll also note that the story is still ongoing. The Commercial Appeal is still reporting on this story, and I'm sure they would welcome any and all input that anybody, you, the Withers family, or anybody, wants to provide as they continue to report this story. I'm not speaking out of school, I would hope, no, for, not at all. for uh, the Commercial Appeal, but I do appreciate your comments. Anybody else have any questions? All right, why don't we call it a wrap and by thanking uh, our panel for a great discussion today. And, 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 and special, spe special thanks, if, if I may, special thanks on behalf of everyone to Chuck Tobin uh, for pulling this together and, and uh, shepherding it. My, my pleasure, and thanks to the National Press Club as well.